Ladies and gentlemen from the flight deck, this is your captain. We're experiencing some very rough air right now. I need everyone to please remain calm and take their seats. On our way down, we may hit some turbulence. Go ahead and brace yourselves for a possible emergency landing. Welcome to America. I'm still in America. Yeah. Beautiful, elegant, sinful, and arrogant. Ooh. It's plenty hysteria after they shot at them schools in that new cafeteria. Don't uh. sneak in our area, cause if you ain't patriotic, you might be a terrorist. <laughs> I know it's embarrassing. We say united, we stand, but divisions are therapy. No GED, no EBT, just BBL. Right? I look good, that CDC said quarantine, my PPP said. My look at your race, what they gonna say? Stay in your place. <laughs> Made a mistake, open the case, open the gates. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead and pray for that visa. See how America treats you. We keep our history shrouded in mystery. Can't let them know all our secrets. Men become ladies. Ladies want more than some babies. They want to be treated like people. Land of the free, but the freedom ain't equal. We love our politics more than our people. Monday we evil, but Friday we good. New little lemon right there in your hood. If you in poverty, go in the lottery. Then we might treat you the way that we should. You can be anything. If you got money, so get it by any means. Hustle is muscle and you looking weak, so you better go get you some creatine. <laughs> get your weight up. Out here in America, man. Hello. I'm still in America, where church is a Broadway production for relevance. We traded the kingdom to build an empire, so people don't trust us, apparently. We worship economy. We'll kill our own babies to keep our autonomy. You mess with our Second Amendment, we probably gon' riot. But take out the probably. I'm still in America. The coast where I live, we ain't speaking much English. We do all the labor and do all the cleaning, but we don't get treated like equals. Some of us trust in the law, some don't. Some law enforcement will save you from evil. You call them and then again, some of them won't. Sometimes we cheat us to get our cheese up and take your piece of the pie. Sometimes we seize us, sometimes we Jesus, and we might get crucified. We preach civil rights, have a civil fight. BLM might take your money, buy expensive flights. Daddy sending kites, mama full of sleepless nights. Base said pipe dream, left wing, right wing, don't go right, you're still on sight. Same gang, but we different colors. Forefathers, but none of us brothers. Some are born here, some are sworn here. Either live free or kill each other. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are when you see this. Welcome to Unlimited Ministry. I am Pastor TK, and we are here uh, to worship the Lord on today. We thank God for you tuning in. And um, if you watched last month, you know that this, I'm sorry, if you watched last week, you know that this month, we are doing things a little bit different as we are in Black History Month. And, um, you know, I believe that the church has a responsibility to not only promote, um, you know, our culture and uh, Black excellence and just Black people and what we have done, what we have accomplished thus far and what we can still accomplish. And not only that, but also to remember where we came from and to teach the history um, to our children, our children's children, um, and maybe even for some of our uh, counterparts or people who are our age and just are not aware of all of the various contributions that we've made in uh, these United States as Black people. Um, and also to bring awareness to the political scene. Uh, we are approaching another election coming and um, just let me make the preference, preference our conversation for today that Unlimited Ministry is not promoting any politician. We are just sharing information, information that is important and relative again uh, to the plight of black people and to um, us as Americans and Black Americans. And so today I'm going to share a video that I came across uh, this week, and I think it is very relevant. And I think that it is important for us to hear voices. Uh, last week I shared a, an historical voice 
But this week we're going to uh, hear the voices of various men and uh, as they converse on different topics that face that black men face here in America. Um, so that will be coming up soon. But before we do that, I just want to uh, provide an opportunity for those of you who have been uh, tuning in and watching these services over the last month. Thank you very much. Uh, some of you have shared uh, some of the recordings and we appreciate you for that. And we're going to also ask that you would join in partnership with us financially. Uh, there are conversations that need to be had and that the Lord wants to speak. But some of these conversations have to happen offline. Uh, and so we are in pursuit of a brick and mortar location. Uh, we have some grants out there. We've been doing some fundraising efforts and um, we have other things in place, but we need your help. We need your support. If this ministry has um, impacted you in any way, you know, be it spiritually, be it uh, educationally, we are a ministry that looks to promote uh, understanding and knowledge. Our scripture for this month is my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And we do. And it's unfortunate. But um, I believe, again, that the church has a duty to help to inform those that we serve. And so that's something that you will find here in this ministry. Um, I am a lifelong learner. Um, I am actually in school right now working on my doctorate. So, um, yeah, I need you to think I don't necessarily need you to think the same way that I do, but I need you to think. I need you to put your thinking cap on. I need you to use the mind that Christ has given us um, and really just think about the world that we're in, you know, um, not just spiritually, but economically, uh, emotionally, physically, all these various things that have been going on and continue to go on in this world and where we sit as a culture, as black people, where do we sit in this grand scheme of things? Um, what narratives are we embracing uh, that the world has put out there about us? What things are we teaching our children uh, that the world has put out there about us? How are we reframing these narratives and uh, helping us to understand that the other is not always gonna be for us. And I'm not trying to say that um, everyone is against us, but there are people who are still in the world that are against us. And so we have to take a stand. We can't just sit by idly and let um, things happen to us, circum you know, circumstances happen to us, but getting to a place where we are no longer um, complacent, complacent with the things that are happening around us. And we are taking a conscious effort to try to make change, to try to build community, to try to bring healness, uh, wholeness, wellness on every uh, aspect and every aspect of our lives. And so this is the work that the ministry is doing, is looking to continue to do at a greater scale. And so again, we need your help. We need your financial support. It takes money. Scripture tells us that, the, that money is the answer to all things. The love of money is the root of evil, but money is the answer to all things. And so in order to uh, stretch further and have a longer reach, we need your support, especially if you're coming here and you are getting fed in any way we are asking that you sow a seed into the work of this ministry. And the information is there for you. Uh, we have it there and I'm gonna also, actually, let me just add it here to the screen. And we are just trusting that uh, you will do what the Lord has put upon your heart. You can give great abundance. Uh, and for those that may not have it in great abundance, we thank you for however you give. No amount is too small and every dollar counts. So we thank you now for your giving and we are going to 
play a little music. Eyes haven't seen And ears haven't heard The kind of blessings The kind of blessings That's about to fall on me Victory is here. Kick the feet out the door. God's doing a new thing. Yeah. Get ready for overflow. Cause I'm getting ready. Jet ski, cause I serve a god that parted the Red Sea. Multi million dollar commercials for Pepsi, from food stamps to more ice than Gretzky. I don't gotta talk, the Lord defends me. I watch them all fall for going against me, cause me and all my angels shot the devil up. While you was trying to pull me down, I leveled up. I leveled up twice, I leveled up three times. He tapped them and told them she's mine. So even when I cried, I knew I'd be fine. Prepare for a miracle blessing in these times. Now praise them, raise them, name it, claim it. Every tongue that rises up against me, shame it. I breathe success in and out my lungs. Got the power of life and death coming out my tongue. How many of you are getting ready for something that you've never seen? How many of you trust that God has something real big in store for you? Amen. Bigger and better. The Lord has promised us that he will do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask, think and or imagine. Amen. So come on, let us pray over our gifts. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you now again for the opportunity to give. Lord, we thank you uh, for those that had a heart and a mind and a desire to give and that they gave according to what you have invoked in their spirits. And God, for those that had a heart, mind and a, and a desire, but had it not, we pray now that you would move in their lives, oh God, move in their circumstances, open up doors for them and make ways out of no way. God, we thank you now 
uh, that these gifts would be used to the furtherance of the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So I don't want to uh, belabor the moment because this video uh, is a little bit long. So we're just going to dive right into it. Amen. This is um, a video on black men in America. Hold on one second. To be a black man in America means having the weight of the world on your shoulders. It forces a different outlook and gives a different perspective. It's being often talked about, but rarely being spoken to. It means being your brother's keeper. Don't boo, boo. Standing tall, proud, and unapologetic. Navigating America as a black man comes with a different style, a cadence, and a rhythm that's all our own. But at this moment, more than anything, it means challenging the status quo and remaking politics in our own image, from the street corner to Capitol Hill. What do you have to lose? Look, what do you have to lose? It's a moment where we define our narratives for ourselves, where we get to say who we are, what we believe, and what matters most. I'm Tremaine Lee, a journalist and storyteller who has spent nearly two decades telling our truth. And I'm Charles Coleman Jr., a civil rights attorney whose passion are the voices and the issues of community. This is a journey to understanding what it means to be a black man today in a highly divided nation. A show about how we see America and how we experience it as one of the most important and still most overlooked voting blocks and how America sees us. This is Black Men in America, The Road to 2024. Welcome to this conversation. What up, my boy? How you feeling? Chilling. All right, all right. Hey. Yeah. Man, let's get this thing started, man. I've been waiting for this for a while. <laughs> let's go. Like, it's time. For a while. Come on, let's get, let's get going. Yeah. So what was like your first conception of black manhood when you knew it was a thing like, like what a black man is? So I grew up watching like a lot of action movies. Yeah. And so you had like James Bond, right. Indiana Jones, all these people who were like rugged, white, white boys. rugged, rugged, <laughs> rugged, rugged white dudes. John Wayne. Right. <laughs> and then the first thing that sort of like tipped me off to it, just from like a pure masculinity standpoint, was Carl Lewis and Action Jackson. Oh, Action Jackson was the truth. Action Jackson was the yeah. deal, yeah. right? For me, we always were surrounded by black figures, whether my okay. sisters, black Barbie dolls, okay. G.I. Joe, Roadblocks. We're always, our eyes and ears were always tuned to that. Right. And so I think those were the earliest, like you said, Ashton Jackson was a big one. Right. Um, Billy D, of course. But also, man, in my family, my, my uncles, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, were, were really important to me. Being a black man in America is complicated. It often means experiencing a multitude of forces and identities all bound together, sometimes in concert, sometimes colliding. We are loved and hated. We are feared and revered. We are a lot of things, but we are no monolith. We are the epitomes of nuance. With another presidential election on the horizon, we're checking in with black men at the sometimes great intersection of culture and politics to hear what matters most in their communities and at the ballot box. My brother, my brother, how you feeling, man? Hey, man, happy Friday. Yeah, likewise, man. Welcome back, you. bro. Everything's good. Bless and highly favored. Well, first of all, happy, happy birthday again, man. You're 40 years old, man. That's oh, yo, yo. A, that's a blessing. Thank you, man. New decade. Now, now, to be a black man at 40, you know, a lot of people haven't made it this far, man. So that's a, that's a gift. Totally. I think, I think sometimes you take that for granted, you know? Mm -hmm. But then we have parties and celebrations once you get older, you kind of realize, you know, yeah. everyone don't make it to that age. That's right. That's right. You know, so e even when we, even when it's, it's long, man, you know, life is still short. So we gotta, we gotta marinate in it. What would you say is the biggest thing that you're thinking about going into 2024? For me, it's absolutely two things: uh, safety and the wealth gap that exists between uh, blacks and the rest of the country. When you say safety, what do you mean? Uh, public safety, police brutality issues, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, as as the father to a young man, 
uh, that's been paramount in my life for the past 25 years, you know, being concerned about him. I grew up in an era where gangs were prevalent. Yeah. Uh, I was more concerned about my son being stopped and shot by the police than I was about gang violence. I'm agreeing with Niles. I think wealth gap is um, something that's extremely important coming into this, this next election. Our generation is kind of in a space where we're earning a little bit more. You know, some of us may be in that dynamic where we're earning more than our parents did. So we kind of have this kind of a survivor's remorse kind of a prime mindset of where do we kind of fall in society these days? You yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah, wealth gap. Whether it's police violence or political violence, black men are sometimes targets and sometimes shields. To understand why being either matters and to dig into a host of other issues, we decided to connect with three black men who in their own ways had taken issues affecting our communities head on. The Reverend Al Sharpton is a legend in the world of civil rights activism. He's been fighting the power for more than 60 years, and he's also the host of the program Politics Nation on MSNBC. Benjamin Crump is often referred to as Black America's Attorney General. He's a civil rights lawyer who has represented the families of dozens of unjustly killed Black Americans, including Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor. And Benny the Butcher is an acclaimed rap artist from Buffalo, New York, He's a pillar and an institution in that city. And he was instrumental in supporting the families of those killed by a white supremacist at a Buffalo grocery store in May of 2022. As black men, 2024, what's the biggest thing you're listening for in terms of someone who's asking for your vote? One issue. Equal protection under the law, criminal justice, everything else can begins and ends if uh, if we are protected to live under the law like everybody else. I can't do nothing dead. Economic freedom, y'all. Mm -hmm. Once we have economic freedom, you know, all the other freedoms are attainable. Education, quality health care, mm -hmm. making sure you got good police in your community. But right now, how many funerals Reverend are going to have to pay for because black people couldn't even afford life right. insurance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My thing is, like, something that's going to directly affect my community. Yeah. Because from being a rapper, like, a lot of those issues, like, it's there for us to clean up. You know what I'm saying? When pe people call my phone, it's the holiday season. People call my phone all the time. They need things for their kids. They can't do certain things. So anything that's going to directly affect my community, mm -hmm. you know I'm saying, where it's going to take a load off of us, going to take a burden off our shoulders, man, I'm all for it. That's what I'm going for. Well, Benny, you caught a lot. You know where I'm going. Yeah, yeah I know where you're going. You know where I'm going. You caught a lot of heat about saying that you would support Trump. Do you still feel that way? This is what I'm going to say. I learned a lot of, of that day. But honestly, that just come from frustration about, you know, things not being right in my community. Okay. And, and wanting to try it a different way. You know what I'm saying? But what I learned, you know, I'm, I'm not a political person. I'm just boots on the ground in the city every day. And it's like... It's very few changes that reach down, that trickle down in our community. I got a lot of flack back from that, but well, when yeah. I realized this, I did realize a lot of black people no. voted Trump. They just don't put it out there like I did. Yeah. I haven't voted since Obama. Uh -huh. You feel what I'm saying? And I don't think anything driven me to go to the polls. I want you to always be honest, man, because the one thing I, I believe is that you got to get to the streets. If they want us to be motivated to come out and vote, we got to make sure people know what the administration is doing. And I think the administration is doing a lot. They just ain't messaged it right to the neighborhood mm -hmm. in our community. Man, Trump and them, you got to give them a little credit for this. They do go give their base red meat. What is it about black men, though, especially because there's a, a sizable chunk of us who are leaning Trump. Some say it's because of the machismo, there's disaffection. Why? so many brothers who find something appealing about Trump. I think it? a lot of it is machismo. I think a lot of it is he plays that swagger. And I think some of them were alienated. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I think that uh, it was wrong alienation. But I, I kept telling a lot of the sisters, don't just talk about black women, man. Just talk about black men, man. You exactly. got to balance this mm -hmm. out. Am, am I right? No, you're 100% right, man. And to me, it's just like, like not being versed politically, just knowing what I know. Uh, it's like, you know, Trump wears who he is in front of us. Right. It was disappointing, you know what I mean, maybe being behind Biden and then coming out and, and figuring out his stance from previous years. 
So it's like, you know, we maybe we thought this guy was a different guy. You know, we like to take people face value. We like to see yeah. who they, we like to see who people are, people are when they stand in front of us. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not easy to tell who people are. You, you know, so deep, man. Right. I do think it's a true messaging problem because when I think just if we thinking about the criminal justice police brutality piece, mm-hmm. I mean, the Biden administration's DOJ has done more than all the other administrations combined, practically. Mm-hmm. I mean, Christian Clark. Christian, you gotta, you gotta man, this Christian. sister, the first black woman over the civil rights division, she has prosecuted more police officers yeah. than Biden, and won the case. Reagan, Trump, mm. Clinton combined. Right, I mean, right, she right. getting all counter errors put in her back because she said, no, nah, I'm gonna call balls and strikes. If you show me a video where they killing George Floyd, they killing the Ahmaud right. Arbery, they are uh, kicking in and lying about Breonna Taylor. They killing uh, Tyree Nichols. She said, I'm prosecuting. And she's been doing it. Mm-hmm. And they attack her for it. As a former prosecutor, the thing that I would always have to deal with is this notion of the circular argument, we go where the crime is. Mm-hmm. And I tell people all the time, if you're looking for something, you're going to find it. So right, it becomes right, right. self-fulfilling right. in terms of, well, we go where the crime is. No, you're going and you're yeah. finding crime. And if you went somewhere else, guess what? You'd You'll find, find it there too. It's like they come up with things to profile us for. And so whatever laws were made, I, I believe this with all the thing in my heart. We can get rid of all the crime in America overnight, just like that. And people ask how attorney Crump change the definition of crime. Mm. Of course. If, if you get to define what conduct is going to be made criminal, you can predict who the criminal is going to be. It sounds yeah. like we're criminal, though. Yeah. Our existence no, is the culture. criminal. They made no, no, no. the laws. They made work. the laws to criminalize our culture. To fit up. Black culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, and so when I think of Eric Garner, I always think of stuff like that. Lucy cigarettes. I did nothing. We sit here the whole time. I'm not business. We you told you. You got to do a cigarette Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Got it and lost his life. Yeah. And then George Floyd was trying to buy cigarettes and so forth. So you have to think about the profile and things that they come up with the profilers for pretextual reasons. And it happens every day, Al. They will come and say, you can't wear baggy pants. Right. Mm-hmm. Make mm-hmm. that a crime. Right. Yeah. Yep. You can't have milk cartons in your yard. Right. Make that a crime. Right. Yeah. Stuff to come and mess with black people about. Because once they have the interaction and confrontation, then it just snowballs from there. They find other things. We, we've to, seen, we've seen right, it, right. The, the violent repercussions, but 2022 had the highest recorded number of police killings ever on record. Right. And we weren't marching the way we were marching. All the reforms that were supposed to happen, Didn't but we happen. had a record number in 2022. Is Didn't it, happen. The reforms failed, the reforms not make it. Why are we where we are? Because you got to have movements, not moments. Mm-hmm. And that's what I said when we was in the thick of Trayvon, George Floyd, is that everybody gets mad for a moment. And oh, we don't even want to deal with the traditional organization. If you do not have traditional organizations lined with those young folks so that those moments turn into movements, they just go right back. They just say, let it pass. And once it passes, it's gone. Coming up on Black Men in America, the road to 2024. From Brooklyn to Capitol Hill, House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries talks about the upcoming election and whether America has held up its end of the deal for African-Americans. Has America made good on its promise to Black men? And if so, how so? If not, how not? And later, we're kicking it with Grammy-nominated artist Jeezy about why some Black men are backing Donald Trump. At least you know what his agenda is because he tells you. And, you know, like they say, the devil you know is, is better than the one you don't. We'll be right back. When you buy or sell your car exactly how you want with car gurus, you might begin to wonder, what if you could do things your way all the time? Dream, 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 dream when I want you in my arms. Some dreams do come true. Get your car your way. Get it with gurus. Everything we build is from the ground up. Every great idea, every crazy idea, every next idea, everything you see, 
everything you feel when you drive it. We put everything we have into our trucks, so you get everything out of them. Ram, trucks are what we do. Get 10% below MSRP for an average of 8,400 under MSRP on the purchase of select 2024 Ram light duty and heavy duty trucks. It almost became a cliche and a joke, but you see Trump and you see blacks for Trump, those signs, and it's almost a joke, but there's something a little serious in it. It's a scene of something real. I wonder how much of that is myth and how much of it is reality in terms of, are we talking about outliers or are we talking about a significant enough portion that is going to shift where the electorate moves? And what's wild is Trump has become this unlikely hero to some for criminal justice. Mm. When he asked, what has Trump done for black folks? A lot of people will say the First Step Act, right? So that's resonating with some people. To get some insight into why some black men support the Republicans, Charles hit the basketball court at Howard University with former Republican National Committee Chair Michael Steele. In 2009, he became the first black person to chair the RNC, but in 2020, he voted for Joe Biden after Trump said the deadly Charlottesville riot, which featured white supremacists and Nazi protesters, had fined people on both sides. He's now one of the co-hosts of The Weekend on MSNBC. We also met up with fellow Howard alum, Jerron Smith. At one point, he was the highest ranking black person in the Trump White House, advising and negotiating with the ex-president on policy positions around criminal justice reform, opportunity zones, and funding for historically black colleges and universities. Is there any reason that a black man should find himself voting Republican in the presidential election? I think there's a lot of reasons to um, vote Republican. Um, we have, a, for the first time in my um, experience, have a real platform that speaks to black Americans. Everything from economic empowerment to affordability to continue to do work on safe communities and, and justice reform. That Republican Party doesn't exist in my view right now. Okay. For the numbers, we both sat down with political pollster and strategist Cornell Belcher, a key advisor to Barack Obama's 2008 and 2012 campaigns. He's also a contributor for MSNBC and NBC News. Men overall vote more Republican than women, regardless of race. It seems odd to a lot of people, given the loyalty that Black people have for the Democratic Party, to see Blacks for Trump. What does that say? I wouldn't say it's a loyalty that Blacks have for the Democratic Party, but I think it's Blacks making rational decisions based on how they see issues and their, and their issue agenda. When you look at African Americans voting for Trump, I think uh, Blacks are susceptible to, to a cult just like white people are, right? How critical will the black male vote be for Democrats or Republicans? How important are we as a black for what happens next? In a lot of these battleground states, it, it, it determines who wins or loses. On the court with Michael Steele and Jerron Smith, Charles asked Smith why he became a Republican in the first place. I saw that despite of who was president, the community I came up with since the riots looked the same. Mm. So I was like, what the Republican Party don't have is somebody with my worldview. And so I, I went out on this whole mission to just like, look, if it's a Republican president, we need someone to talk to him. Are you still on the Trump train? I'm still on, yes, honestly, when it comes to um, reforming the criminal justice system, because the conservatives that were against justice reform, they wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for President Trump. How do you then square your support for a man who says at a rally, maybe the police need to rough them up a little bit more? Maybe they need to be more aggressive. But then when that candidate goes out in front of an entire, right. you know, nation of folks and says that, how do you then go to work and be like, this is my guy? It makes my job a lot harder, I'll tell you that, especially with working with the Black community. Let's take Charlottesville, for example. Right after that, he had his, uh, a meeting with Senator Scott, um, and Senator Scott talked about Opportunity Zones. Um, opportunity Zones is a place-based um, economic um, piece that brought $50 billion of new capital into um, low-income census tracts throughout the country. Here's the translation problem. Charlottesville happens. Senator Scott goes to the White House. The conversation then moves to opportunity zones. Right. I was just about to point that out. Because, right, you, so I'm so you glad you said that. miss the yes. part where you go, there are fine people on both sides. Right. And that's where the black voice inside the administration has to matter. Because in that moment, the conversation isn't about, well, here's opportunity zones. No, the conversation is, Mr. President, you just equalized the Klan. 
with what happened on the on that street in Charlottesville and said that they're fine people. That's not the conversation Black America wants to hear from you right now. That's where I drew the line. That's where I've always drawn the line. That when I walk in the room, I'm bringing this in the room. And I'm going to bring to the table a reflection of the experience of my community. If you look at how cozy not only Donald Trump is, but a, a lot of the Republicans who, who are running with white nationalists or how at least how they won't condemn that, it makes it real problematic for African Americans who who see rising racism and discrimination as a top issue concern. And yet, Belcher says somewhere between 12 to 15 percent of Black men have been voting Republican for decades, and he's not seeing any significant changes in either direction anytime soon. But what is changing? The margins are getting tighter. The top threat to political power for our community isn't, you know, Blacks voting Donald Trump. It is African Americans disengaging. There's so much disillusionment and growing cynicism about either party. That activism will take an off-ramp, and the third parties are an, are an off-ramp. Is there any point to suggest that Black men, especially in mass, will be taking that off-ramp? Do we have a sense? I mean, we know the disillusionment, but... Well, it doesn't take it, take it in mass. Look, if 10% of Black men vote third party, the election's over. That's just 10%. Yeah. Election's That's over, hmm. right? It doesn't take a lot of numbers. It's not like these battleground states are being won by large margins. They're not. Should Democrats be worried? Yes, they should be, absolutely, because they've squandered hmm. the, the relationship, very much like Republicans squandered the relationship. And so you have, you have right now this look, this look over towards what Trump is, because what they're getting now is not meeting their, their political interests or their political needs. What are both sides doing wrong? Everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything. What could both sides do better? Just acknowledge our history. Mm. Can you just acknowledge our history in this country? Next on Black Men in America, The Road to 2024. We're speaking with House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries about whether the party's message is resonating with voters. And you know we had to ask him one of the most pressing questions of our time. Actually, I actually have the most important question of this entire interview. Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas. You got to get that laugh right, bro. <laughs> Oppenheimer, one of the best movies of the century, is coming to Peacock. It's happening, isn't it? Nominated for 13 Academy Awards. I don't know. If we can be trusted with such a weapon, we have no choice. Including Best Picture. Are we saying there's a chance that we destroy the world? And Best Director Christopher Nolan. Three. The president needs to know what's next. Two. What's next? One. Oppenheimer, streaming exclusively on Peacock, February 16th. Looks like you won something there. Yeah. I did my tax guy and switched to H&R Block. I feel like a tax champion. Is that easy? So much more convenient. I just walked in, met with an expert, or a pro can do your taxes online. And with that upfront transparent pricing, I knew the price before I even began. I've never won anything in my whole life. You should make the switch. There's still time, Todd. Have an H&R Block Tax Pro do your taxes in person or online. It's better with Block. Among the long list of prominent, powerful men to have served in Congress, Black men have carved out a legendary trail up to Capitol Hill. From the earliest days of Reconstruction, through the Civil Rights era and beyond, Black men have used the ballot as their weapon of choice. Brother leaders like Senator Hiram Rhodes Revels, a free man his entire life, who in the shadow of the Civil War became the very first Black man to serve in the U.S. legislature. On his shoulders and well into the 20th and 21st centuries, others would stand political giants like John Lewis, James Clyburn, Elijah Cummings, and Barack Obama, all who'd graced the halls of Congress. But in 2023, Black men stood even taller, making history when Brooklyn, New York's own Hakeem Jeffries officially assumed the role of House Democratic leader, becoming the first person of color to lead a major American political party in the legislature. In this historic moment, with the future of our democracy in question and with Black voters looking for answers. We went to D.C. to talk with Jeffries about how his party's message is resonating with voters and if Black voices 
are still being heard on Capitol Hill. But now one thing that is interesting, I mean, obviously you want representation really of the people, which is lacking in so many, in, in so many of these uh, quarters here. But to see Hakeem Jeffries, his, his rise has been um, very interesting. He, it he's is. emerged from he's, a place that is very unlikely. He's a Brooklyn guy. Yeah. He's a Brooklyn guy. I mean, I think that that is a lot of what we're talking about because even as he is probably the closest thing to you or me that we've seen in that space, young, black, undeniably male, black. undeniably Hakeem. black, coming right. <laughs> the brother's name is Hakeem. Hakeem. That's right. Coming from Brooklyn. That's right. So it's going to be very interesting to find yeah. out how this brother navigates. Yeah. Wow, man, how you been? Is it you? How you doing? Brother Lita, thank you for having us. Great to be with you. Now, it's been a long time since I was chasing you in the, the state house in Albany. That's right. <laughs> a lot has changed. And I wonder how you've evolved, but also how your experience as a black man in America has shaped your leadership style, especially in this new role. You know, from my perspective, when I transitioned from my prior position as chair of the House Democratic Caucus to House Democratic leader, it was an extraordinary change. And I thought about it in the context of myself growing up, born in Brooklyn Hospital, raised in the Cornerstone Baptist Church, coming of age in the midst of the crack cocaine epidemic, and then being able to emerge to serve in the House of Representatives and ultimately lead the Democratic Party in the Congress, that it was a classic example that this principle in America of representative democracy, of government of the people, by the people, and for the people, isn't just a concept, because that is what the framers actually aspired to create. Today, Hakeem's leadership style is quite simple. Spread love, it's the Brooklyn way. They may not have envisioned someone named Hakeem Sekou Jeffries Certainly not. <laughs> Probably in this particular not. position. But they did aspire to this concept of the House, in particular, being the closest to the American people and reflecting the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, the fears, the concerns, the anxieties, and the passions of the American people, in part informed by their life experiences. Has America made good on its promise to Black men? And if so... How so? If not, how not? Now, it was Frederick Douglass who once made the observation that it is easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. And he said that in the 1800s. It's a principle that still applies today. Now, over the last several years, I think statistically it's clear that a lot of progress has been made for the African-American community generally and for African-American men specifically in terms of the stewardship of President Joe Biden. It may not be felt to the degree that it should, but things have moved in the right direction. Those disparities aren't just some, like, byproduct. They're, they're baked in. And I wonder what you think, from your estimation, policy-wise or other, what is owed to Black America? I think it's truth, reconciliation, and transformation, which is why I've been deeply troubled by a lot of what has emerged uh, from some of the extreme right-wing forces in this country that want to erase Black history. And in doing so, you're erasing American history because Black history is American history. And the notion that some would suggest or want to teach our children that slavery was a job training program uh, that personally benefited African Americans is outrageous. And in the view of many of us, myself included, designed to undermine the ability to make progress in areas that connect to basic American values. Diversity is an American value. Equity is an American value. Inclusion is an American value. Opportunity in every single zip code for African-American men and everyone is an American value. When we are talking to black men in terms of the messaging and the messenger, that comes from the left or that comes from Democrats. So we got the messenger. We got one of us. We got someone who we can identify with. But I think that there's an element of how the message itself 
is being crafted that does not resonate, it doesn't land. Where is the appeal specifically for our vote? Well, I think, one, that it's going to be important for us to articulate a clear vision for how do we take people who are living under certain conditions with too many challenges and allow African-American men, just like everyone else, should be entitled to living the American dream. That's not too much to ask. Now, we've also done some things legislatively, including in the context of criminal justice reform. We just celebrated the fifth anniversary of the passage of the First Step Act, and it was the most significant criminal justice reform legislative effort in the last 25 years to begin to reverse uh, the consequences of mass incarceration, which disproportionately fell on black men. Now, what's interesting is that since the passage of the First Step Act, and it relates to criminal justice reform at the federal level, since that's where we have jurisdiction, approximately 30,000 people have been released from the federal prison system. 90% of those individuals were black men. I think the one person who gets a lot of credit for that is Donald Trump. Yeah, you know, this was a Democratic initiative that had been in existence for years, and we did have Republican partners. I'd give Congressman Doug Collins credit, but, you know, we did successfully convince Donald Trump to sign it into law. And that's part of his record. Now, he's done a hundred other things to undermine economic security, the right to vote, Donald Trump has done a lot to facilitate the rise of white supremacy in the United States of America. And who do we think is going to bear the brunt of that rise in racism and white supremacy and the targeting of communities of color? Probably African-American men will be at the forefront of bearing the brunt. But I think it's also important to note that the Trump forces intentionally tried to manipulate perceptions for one reason and one reason alone, because he primarily cares about himself. I actually have the most important question of this entire interview. I spoke to someone who you might have grown up with in your house. Yeah. And the brother said that you hate slow jams so much that your wife had to strong arm you to get Kenny Lattimore to be your first dance. Why do you hate slow jams so much? And finally, Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas. You got to get that last one <laughs> right, bro. You can't get that Well, last. the first one, I do want to know why you hate slow jams so much. You got to go home, bro. Just remember that. <laughs> well, I'm just partial to hip hop and R&B, one. And I've just generally been of the view, and I think this is probably the reality that before I was in Congress, while I'm in Congress, subsequent to Congress, there are a lot of stressors in life. So when I have the opportunity to lean into music, lean into movies, right, lean into sports, I don't want to be depressed. And Biggie, Jay-Z, or Nas, who, uh, of those three? Well, I'm going to ride with Biggie as the first amongst equals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jay-Z is an incredible artist just on the music alone. And we're so proud of uh, him, what he's accomplished, um, his brilliance, and his entrepreneurship. And Nas, even though he's from Queens, you know, we if rock we with him. <laughs> Illmatic, Stillmatic, brilliant. Up next, we're headed to Chicago to talk about what it means to become a strong black man. More black men in America, the road to 2024, after a quick break. So you think a VR workout isn't a real workout? Tell that to your shoulders, your core, your heart rate. This is Unreal Fitness. This is Supernatural. With all these hills and honors points, I could stay for free. Mm hmm But the wall of Astoria and the Maldives? What about the canopy in Paris? Mm -hmm. Hills and honors, babe. When you want points that can take you anywhere, it matters where you stay. Hilton, for the stay. When Barbara switched to TurboTax? I broke four generations of family tradition with five little words. Ma, I want to make perfume. <laughs> Getting my business off the ground was a full-time job. So I made Barbara's new site gate count by guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and a maximum refund. Make your moves. We'll make them count. Intuit TurboTax. 100% accuracy guaranteed. You know what I think about a lot? 
I think about how much we associate someone's ability to throw hands with like being a man. Like you, right. like, have you ever heard a woman but say, word, right. oh, my, my guy better be able to fight, right? What if your dude can't fight? I know coming up, um, being able to throw hands, being able to fight, got you out of situations. But also for me, and this is obviously we don't condone fighting for kids. I think there should be less fighting in the world. But I know I could be sensitive and I could do whatever I want to because come see me. What does it mean to be a young black man in America, to be a son, a brother, a father? What does it mean to have all eyes on you, to be a scapegoat, a boogeyman, a public enemy? What does it mean to fight your way to something bigger than yourself, to be your brother's keeper? What is it about I went to Chicago to find out, where I met James Adams, Julius Robinson, and Lazarus Daniels. They're all 20-somethings, all fathers, partners, and mentors. They bonded as teenagers when they had the amazing opportunity to be mentored by a role model who looked just like them, who also just happened to be the most powerful man in the world. They were part of Becoming a Man, or BAM, a decades-old mentorship program and the inspiration for President Barack Obama's signature outreach effort aimed at young men and boys of color, My Brother's Keeper, which he launched in 2013, a year after the killing of Trayvon Martin. You know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. We talked about becoming a man and what being a man really means. Describe a positive anger expression. What is that? I know it's a key pillar to what you all do. Basically, just instead of lashing out, you know, you can go work out. You know, you can do something like that. Uh, talk to your guys, you know. Dang. Go, go no, dang. hit a punching bag instead of hitting somebody, you know. Just putting that negative, self-destructing type of anger into something positive, something that you can benefit from. Knowing what's the cause of the anger. That's another way of knowing positive anger expression. So just not only can you do things, you can talk things out. Mm -hmm. I'm big on communication. Does it feel that the, the world sometimes uh, neglects us, as black men especially, young black men, or pathologizes us, or puts us in a certain corner? Does it feel like the world kind of just pushes us to, to the side? Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, there's no margin forever for a black man. Actually, being a big black man with locks, <laughs> no matter how big my smile is, mm -hmm. they already feel a way. The way you act, physically move to the world is also yeah. creating... Police officers pulling us over daily, and it's something I tell my students. So you got to keep yourself above the game because just being where you're supposed to be these days doesn't work for us. So you got to be above the game. You got to be a step ahead. You got to be aware. You got to be a paying, paying attention. You got to be accountable for your actions. Certain things you just cannot do as a black man. Like what? Just driving around with, with multiple people in the car. How tired, and y'all are young brothers, mm -hmm. how tired are y'all of having to maneuver and dance around and smile your way out and be cool and all these rules? Is it tiring? It's yeah, very it's tiring. tiring. It's very tiring. Sometimes you can't take a certain route home from work, you know? Does it feel that politicians are paying attention to young black men especially? No. You didn't even, you didn't even hesitate. It's just not. Nah. It's just a showboat. It's just a face. I don't think the politicians in Chicago are doing their best. I think they're doing what needs to be done for them mm -hmm. to make their dollar. How much is our responsibility? And are we slacking our responsibility as black men to some degree to help save some of our communities, our families. I believe so. Yeah, we, yeah. we all are. We we all could do more, you yeah. know? And Never I, too I, much. I, Never I feel too like much. it starts with catching these young men earlier in their childhood because mm -hmm. now we're losing, you know, children at a younger age. When you think of Bam and My Brother's Keeper, what does it mean to be your brother's keeper? Clearly there's a brotherhood here. What mm -hmm. does it mean to be your brother's keeper, though? Just having a shoulder for your, your next fellow man, you know, like your brother, you feel me? Like, be there for that person. Just having someone that you can go to and, uh, you know, let out a little bit, uh, vent to. Because, uh, man, we're basically taught to, you know, bottle up our emotions. And that, that kind of creates a uh, downfall for a lot of men. It creates stress, you know. Every day we're growing, getting better, trying to learn. And uh, one thing we need to learn is how to deal with emotions and everything that we deal with day to day, being a man of color, a black man, a brown boy, you know, so being able to talk to my brother and let him know that I'm here for you. This idea about accountability, about uh, emotional openness with each other, that's what it sounds like, these seeds 
that you're carrying into your personal relationships now? Accountability um, is one of the biggest things. I got a brother right now. I got multiple brothers, but I got one particular brother that gets on me if he smelled that I'm slacking. Being a teacher, I'm telling my students how to be accountable. My students have to come in, blazer, tie, button up shirt, belt, dress shoes. When I was telling me yesterday how you left your shoes at home. Now, you know, it's consequences for that. You're not in uniform. And I tell them daily consequences outside of school. This man is actually cutting you slack. This woman is actually cutting you slack. Because once you leave here, and you're the black boy that you are, the police ain't gonna cut you slack. Up next, we're talking to the one and only acclaimed rap artist Jeezy about where he stands on the presidential election and why some in the hip hop community have lost faith in politics. I told my team, I said, you know what? I don't really trust politics. I don't. Because everybody I sat down with, they've made all these broken promises, not just to me, but to our people. And they've done nothing. Want big fitness energy without a big investment? Join Planet Fitness now through February 16th. Say big during the Big Fitness Energy Sale and get energized with a membership that fits your budget. In the judgment-free zone, you can work out when it works for you with most clubs open 24 hours. Never intimidating. Always free fitness training. Equipment for every workout. Don't miss out. Join today online, in club, or on the free PF app. Hurry, deal ends Friday, February 16th. A car is a car. Is a spa. Mm. An office. Hi. Hello. A cinema. So automated. Yes, the definition of a car changes. But one thing stays the same it's a Mercedes Benz. You know, music, such an important part of our identity and our culture, specifically hip hop. I would say hip hop, art, they're all like reflections of our culture and how we experience America. And they help to tell our story. They use our language. They help capture what it is that so many want to say about what they experience, but can't put into words. That's right. Let's go. Music has long been a way that black men have found our voice and used it to paint the world just as we see it. Genres like soul, the blues, jazz, R&B, and rap have all given voice to our hopes, our aspirations, our passions, and even our pain. For many of us, music, hip-hop in particular, is life. There we so we there knew we, we wanted to sit down with an artist who uses the heartbeat of the streets and the pulse of the people to give us a sense of how the broader hip-hop community is watching the race for the White House. Platinum recording artist Jeezy is a proud son of Atlanta through and through. He gave us the anthem of all anthems. My president is black, back when Barack Obama was running for office in 2008. Tremaine and I took a trip down to the A to check him out and hear what he had to say. There are more people in high profile positions, a lot of rappers, influential rappers saying, I don't know about the Democratic Party. Right. I don't know about this politics. Right. Why do you think folks disengaged? And what is it about this moment in particular where people aren't as locked in? They're not seeing the, the action. You know what I'm saying? It's like going to church. If your preacher talks to you every time you go there, you're going to go to church. But if you go to church and your preacher ain't talking to you, why are you right. there? <laughs> like, the action, like, the gestures of it, like, the, the audio no match the video, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes anybody discouraged because at least you got to tell me what it is you plan to do, even if you don't do it. You can tell me, praise the Lord, hallelujah, all these things, but, but, talk, but talk to me. Talk, talk to, to me. You know what I'm saying? If a candidate comes and talks to you mm. and says, Jeezy, we're trying to reach this demographic. Right. We need to really get our message out and we need your help. Right. What are you looking for from them? I mean, it's, it's hard to say because I'm going to vote for a mayor that I think is going to understand the city because that's closer to me. Mm. Because I've seen the work he or she has done, right? Because that's in my ecosystem. But when you start talking about outside of really far away, it's kind of like, disconnected. Right, because yeah. it's just like, what are you going to do for us? And, and, I, and I could be totally wrong. I'm just telling you, like, 
And and, and the crazy thing is I, I, I told my team, I said, you know what? I don't really trust politics. I don't. Yeah. Because everybody I sat down with, they've made all these broken promises, not just to me, but to our people. Mm -hmm. And they've done nothing. And they use our influence. They use they use us mobilizing people. They use us when they need us. They come to the city. They want to sit down. And what do we need to do? And we point all these ideas. And I've been invited to the White House and all these things several times. And I I have to sit there and 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 think about it with my integrity. That has nothing to do with me. Yeah. When you talk about integrity, mm. I wonder why so many black men are lining up behind Trump. Mm. Right. Obviously, Barack Obama was the first black president. Right. He's a hip hop fan. He right. spoke our language. He's organized on the south side of Chicago. He's right. there. Right. Donald Trump is an abyss away from that. Right. What do you think it is? And we don't want to overstate how many. I'm only glad I only took a sip of this drink because I see what you're <laughs> taking this. <laughs> this is the only thing that I'm going to say. Yeah. I don't know Trump personally. I don't know nothing about him. The only thing I've heard people say in a conversation when it comes to him is that at least, you know, what his agenda is because he tells you that's what yeah. it is and you know like they say the devil you know is is better than the one you don't like i've never voted for him you know what i'm saying but at the same time i've heard the conversations so hip-hop has always had this very important space as the mouthpiece of the culture mm. at the juncture of like community right. and politics i don't necessarily know that we've had another contemporary message as powerful as my president is black mm, strong super right, simple strong. Right, right super straightforward right before you get there what's your first introduction to any sort of political consciousness my first introduction was tupac he would say certain things about certain politicians i'm like man you can say that but it showed me he was a revolutionary and he stood for something and where we come from you know, nobody stands up against that. And then I started seeing um, a lot of what Barack was doing. And let's take the politics out of it, right? What I saw was a black man, a black woman, two beautiful kids, and they're trying to contribute to the world. And for me, that meant more than anything because it looked like a unit and it looked strong. So I was more into that part, right? I believe that he really wanted to do the job and he was going to put his best foot forward and he had a queen with them that was gonna be by his side every step of the way. So I recorded the record four months before he won. And again, I wanted to do my part, right? And all the things that we did in the community to um, help with that, like busting people to the polls. I voted for the first time. They're sending lawyers out to let people know in the neighborhood that even if you was a convicted felon, you could still vote because it was bigger than us. It was about, it was bigger than music. It was about us. And I wanted to be a part of that as well. Did you ever hear from Barack about it? Okay. Real Gotta quick. Hear the story. Real quick. So the Obama administration invites me to a correspondence dinner in New York by my whole crew, Tom Ford suits, this is it. I'm going to meet my guy. I get there, I see Oprah going in, this one going in, that one going in. My security gets out and the Secret Service meets him at the door. He uh -oh. can't come in. And I'm like, I'm devastated. First of all, I'm embarrassed, yeah. I'm devastated. And I go back to the hotel and I'm like, man, like no matter how much good you do, it's just like you're still, and that, and that was, an issue too because I had to realize my past ain't like the average rapper's past. I was a part of things that were, were major and there was probably a conflict of interest. And I was mad. You know what I'm saying? I was hurt. And I'll never forget maybe about a year later, year and a half, two years later, my mom called me and she said, baby, did you hear the, uh, the president shout you out? In my first term, I sang Al Green. In my second term, I'm going with young Jeezy. Was my emotions in it when he, I couldn't get in? Yes, right? But to me, the nod meant way much more because that means I see you even from where you are. And sometimes I told you, you have to meet people where they at. Mm -hmm. And respected you, see you and respect you. There you go.
My brother, my brother, my man. God. What's good with you? How you feeling? Good to see you, man. You as well. It's been a while. We've been moving. Do a lot of work. Shaking and baking, brother. Yes, sir. Good, man. <laughs> Think about this. Brooklyn, New York, D.C., Atlanta, Chicago, a rare window into the minds and thoughts of Black men on politics and life. There's no way to cover all the issues and topics. What stands out to you in terms of what we didn't get a chance to put in the special? You know, I think that there are so many different aspects of Black manhood and how they show up, particularly in the political conversation. We didn't really get a chance to explore any of the issues facing our Black queer brothers. We didn't get a chance to explore issues with respect to how we as Black men are responding to the purported culture wars. And then there are the hard issues, Black men in healthcare, Black men in employment, the working class Black men and how they show up. All of these are things that, for me, are going to have an impact on the election that we haven't scratched the surface with just yet. The one thing that I think has resonated most with me is how disconnected so real from the system and the process. And even though uh, brothers might be neglected and overlooked politically in their households, in their communities, they are there for each other. They literally are my brother's keeper, making sure that when no one else hears us, we hear us. I think for me, the thing that resonates most is the idea that, hey, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And I think that that's one of the things that was so important. Oftentimes the image of black men in America is one where we have to either be completely in lockstep with one another or oftentimes at odds. And this was a conversation that showed we don't always have to agree, but that has nothing to do with the fact that I still see you as my brother. And that was super important. If anything, all of our travels and conversations have been to me an exercise in brotherhood. And no matter mm. what is happening now, we know that our, our steps moving forward will be stronger together. And to that, my brother, Cheers to you, to brotherhood, to brotherhood, and what's next? Indeed. Amen, amen. I hope that uh, you received something from that video, and just know that um, for the month of February, we will have things like that to present uh, during this worship service. But some of the things. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. Some of the things that um, resonated with me were policing, politics, financial wealth, a fair playing ground, acknowledging our past, family, community, emotions, and letting them out. Black men as a counselor, chaplain, I will say, um, I highly recommend that you guys let those emotions out either by talking to somebody, either by writing it, either by uh, creating music, art, whatever you need to do to get those emotions out. And I'm only saying this to the black men because women typically uh, don't have a problem with talking about how we feel, but men uh, not so much. And so I just wanna encourage women to, to become a safe space for men to be able to articulate those things and not feel judged and don't bring them back up Again, uh, let them let it out. You guys talk about it. Even if it's not your man, if it's your son, if it's your brother, whoever it is, what if it's a friend um, and have those conversations, men, one with another. Uh, there is a, a tour um, that has been here in Michigan before and I'm hoping to bring it back again, uh, Just Hill Bro. Um, a community of men expressing their emotions and just talking about uh, different things that come to play when we stuff those emotions down. That's another sermon for another day. But emotions, disenfranchisement, uh, all of the isms, racism, um, sexism, all those things at the end of the video you saw where they were talking about the different things that they did not get a chance to address in the video. So all of those things and just healing uh, at large, you know, and this video, of course, is about black men in America. We do know that uh, some of these same situations happen to women and black women in America as well. And so, um, I don't want to negate that, but I did come across come across this video uh, this week. And so I just wanted to share it again. I think that all of our voices collectively are important. 
But I will say as a mother of a young black man, I'm always looking to hear the male's perspective. Uh, and plus I was raised with a brother and four male cousins. So um, I think that we should support each other. Uh, and that's one of the challenges too. Uh, the way that black men and black women communicate and interact and support each other and or don't support each other. And again, that's another sermon for another day. We've been here for an hour. Um, I hope again that you were blessed by something that was shared on this video. And again, please support the ministry. Uh, we would really appreciate your financial support as we again are looking to do bigger and better things through unlimited ministry. Until we meet again next week. God bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.